I'll be really interested to see what my wines from this vintage look like in bottle. You can always see the, the joy of the person making the wine and the wines, but I just, I, I think it's undeniable. You know, I'll, I'll be interested to see how the wines in the bottle look, if they'll be bouncy or if they'll be a little bit subdued. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Sales of alcohol at our local bottle shop may have increased, but not all alcohol produced in Australia is sold through retail. In fact, the humble cellar door and restaurants are the only platform for many small producers. The restaurant floor is a way for sommeliers to showcase the innovation and talent of our incredible winemakers. But with restaurants limited to takeaway, many no longer have a pipe to market. Charlotte Hardy has made wine all over the world and now owns Charlotte Dalton Wines in South Australia's Adelaide Hills. Charlotte, how are you going? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Listen, I'd like to get your perception on an experience on what has happened from this pandemic, you know, being a small operator. Um, that first sort of, when you first started noticing changes, can you tell us what the impact was? Yeah, it was pretty sudden. So, um, because I am a small brand, I set my brand up five years ago and I was still working full time. So I um, have distributors nationwide, wonderful distributors. And they um, obviously sell into restaurant and independent bottle stores. I don't sell into any other big chains or any other larger places. So um, pretty much overnight when those restaurants closed, um, our sales, my sales just plummeted. Can you give us a scale of, of your business? Like, oh, you know, there's so many small producers in Australia. What, what's the size of your business? So I'm about 1,400 cases, so pretty small, but um, not teeny-weeny anymore. It's my living, you know. It's our bread and butter. It's the food on the table. What sort of uh, initiatives have you had to put in place um, in the, straight off the bat to sort of deal with that immediacy of that kind of the, that shutdown? So that was um, quite tricky, really. So we had to, we have a cellar door. I have a cellar door with my partner, Ben. He has another wine brand, Cook Brothers. And that had been going really well down at Port Elliot. So we'd sort of based our new business plan in recent months around selling a bit of wine through there. So that closed. So um, obviously it's just without the restaurants there initially, they just closed and there was nothing we started thinking, obviously, discounting online, which I was really uncomfortable with for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there's not that much fat in my brand. And secondly, I didn't want to cheapen my brand. Like, my brand is priced where it's priced because the wine is worth what it's worth. So um, I did that a couple of times, a few sort of Instagram posts, you know, 25% off, 20% off, but it felt awful. So then um, I was really thrilled when the local restaurant industry, they just – picked themselves up and just just restructured their businesses and so many of them are now selling takeaway with wine and that has really helped and I also to my mailing list I do just you know two day specials Um, and that's been really good because my loyal supporters are supporting me still and that's helping a lot. Can you sort of uh, paint a picture for us of why small producers their pipe to market is through restaurants and not really part of the bigger uh, retail alcohol brands in Australia? Well, we're small. So quite often the the big um, companies need big volume to shift. Um, And on a personal note for me, I like my wine to be accessible to um, everyone, you know, the people that are going out for dinner, the people that are shopping at their small independent retail i like to be accessible in the in the local market so supporting local restaurants local local bottle stores um not huge um overseas owned or or big corporation owned businesses um so distribution is the distribution company that i use the companies that i use uh they are small and they do target those little places and they get the wine in front of the people where I want it to be and where it's the story is still told about the brand. So you're going into a bigger bottle store and grabbing a bottle off the shelf, you don't know, you know, you don't know what you're drinking, you don't know the story behind it. It's not, it's not, you just don't find out, you take it home, you drink it. 
you don't get the full experience. But the places where my wines are sold, they, you know, the story's there. If it's a small independent retailer, they know I've been in there, I've spoken to them. Or a restaurant, I've been in there, I've spoken to them. They know how it's made. They know the care that's put into it. They know my story. They know the background of the wine. They know why I make it. And it's just nice to have the wine available to those people. It's important. When we were talking to sommelier Chris Morrison, he said there's no better place on the planet to sell wine than the restaurant floor, and that doesn't exist at the moment. Um, How important is that, do you think, to Australian wineries? And how do you see the future of that on-premise wine Mm. market? Gosh, I see hopefully the future... Well, firstly, I think that our people that own those establishments are amazing because they're really good at thinking outside the box. They don't, um, they don't give up. They're just going. They're just doing it. So I, in my mind, the future is really bright. They're just going to jump up. They're going to be enthusiastic. And it's going to, um, it's, it's going to be big. You know, people are going to be out supporting them, I hope. Because, you know, when there were bushfires down here, um, all, all over Australia, sorry, the Australian um, hospitality industry, I, don't, I can't think of anyone that didn't jump on board and raise money for that. And so I hope that, and not just for winemakers, but for everyone that lost something. So I hope that the, the, the population of Australia get behind them and give them back something. There's that. Um, and also there's collaborations, all these collaborations that have come out through this. Uh, enormous. All the egos dropped out of it. People are just getting together and with the common goal of people doing well and getting back up on their feet. So I think that hopefully, well, I do think that that will continue, that that the collaborations between different um, venues, between different producers, between different winemakers, it's, it's huge. It's awesome. It's amazing. Can you give us some examples of how some of the initiatives that restaurateurs and chefs um, have benefited you and your product with some of the ways that they've adapted and allowed sales of your wine? Yeah, so um, down here there's a great company uh, called Chefs on Wheels. It's got some pretty rock star chefs involved. Involved. It's got um, Paul Baker, M.M. Caskill, just really great people. And they're out delivering. They're making amazing food and delivering and delivering wine as well. So they've put me on their li- list. They only have a few people. And they're doing really great um, food. So they're doing affordable food. So for the people that um, couldn't necessarily afford to go out every week and eat, they're, um, they're also filling that void as well. So they're doing family-sized, delicious, affordable food. So it's such a good initiative. And then um, places like Africola that are open for takeaway. So they've got um, takeaway wine as well. So that it's just, it's almost like, um, it's almost like having the restaurant in your lounge, I guess. So there's still a wine list to choose from and it's amazing. I think uh, a lot of us take for granted or don't quite know the level that, and what's involved in producing wine. You know, we can go to a bottle shop and say, well, I don't want to spend more than $20 or you're in a restaurant, you might not want to spend more than 50. Uh, What does it take to make a wine? And can you tell us a bit about your wines? Yeah, so it's, um, well, it's a year long or longer process. So there's a lot involved. You know, there's, there's the sourcing of vineyard, there's a convincing a grower to sell wine to you. So my, I started my brand in 2015 after 15 years trotting around the globe making wine. Um, I started it in my shed at Basket Range and it was tiny. So I brought grapes off my neighbour, Phil Broderick, um, picked them straight into my fermenter and then on the way home dropped the fermenter on the driveway <laughs> <laughs> and all the grapes spilt all over the driveway. So oh. there's a bit of terroir in that first vintage <laughs> from the driveway. <laughs> um, so tiny. And, and I was consulting to bigger companies and the more – that they were, that was, it was such a juxtaposition, I guess. My tiny little brand that was based on pretty uh, minimal anything and then consulting to these big, big companies. So I, you know, became more and more detached from my consulting and, and now I'm full-time Charlotte Dalton. So the um, to start the brand, I had to convince all these growers that I'd, wor- I'd worked with all of the fruit that I still work with now. I'd worked with in previous jobs or consulting. I had to convince them to sell me some. And that's tricky because growers... You know, they can sell a whole vineyard to one big company and it's done and get paid good money and it comes off in one hit and they're done. So getting them to sell you two tonnes sometimes with some growers is a bit of, yeah, <laughs> a bit of a, yeah you've got to beg and plead sometimes. 
Um, but I knew that I, I knew the fruit that I wanted and I really wanted it and I wasn't going to start my brand without it. And I started with Semyon and Shiraz because I love those two varieties. And so you start walking the vineyards and then you get the fruit and the whole time you are on the edge of your seat, you know, have you picked it at the right time? Are you, should you be putting it in oak? Should you not? You know, you, you, how hard do I press it? Do I really need to get every single milliliter out of here or is that going to compromise my brand? So you're always thinking about the cost versus the quality. Um, and it just goes on all year like that. You're always, which is great. I love that. I love that sort of tension. That's what's well, not tension, but that, that, that questioning that's involved because it forces you to experiment and year after year do something different and have little side batches going on. And um, then you finally bottle and you can bottle after six months or nine months or 12 months or 18 months so you ha- or 24 months. So you have a lot invested um, sitting there in your winery and then you put it in a bottle and, you, and the emotional investment is insane. Like you're so proud and worried and is are people going to like it are people going to hate it i love it is everyone else going to see what i see in it you know is everyone going to see my soul through this thing and then you release it to the market and then um the worst thing is when someone says yeah why is that whatever price when you you know (laughs) when they want a 15 dollar bottle of wine they shouldn't be hunting down their small brands perhaps so it's um there's so much involved in it. And it's, you know, uh, grapes cost money, so you don't want to be screwing that up. We've got to look after our growers, so we've got to make sure that we pay our growers what the what the grapes are worth and, and give them the credit they deserve because without great fruit, you can't make great wine. And um, barrels are expensive, tanks are expensive, winemaking is expensive, time's expensive. It's just, it's, yeah. And it's at a small scale, all that stuff is amplified. You know, you're speaking of like having questions all the time and, you know, the uncertainty of getting the balances right and all of these things that can impact on making a wine. I wonder when you get to the final result and it's in the bottle and then you pour it into a glass, does it taste like you expected it to? Is there unexpected experiences? Does the wine, um, you know, act as the way that you expected? Like I'd like to get your perception on that. Never, never acts as I think. <laughs> never in is it in the glass what I think when I'm in the vineyard. <laughs> it's always taken some diverse road somewhere. Um, I, I guess now um, I've just done my sixth vintage for my brand and, and I've worked with the same growers the whole way through. So I guess now I can walk the vineyard and I can kind of maybe have thoughts about how it might end up in the bottle and in my mind I can have this style that I'd like to end up with but that's not what dictates it it's the process so the grapes you know they come in they're delicious I, I, I'm in love with them right from the start but then it changes as you as you make them you sort of look at it and go ah, oh, perhaps I no, perhaps I will do this or I won't do that you know so it, it's a it's a living sort of a thing and every time you look at it a new decision's made so that initial style that I think I'm making is never what ends up in the bottle. But it's always something that I love. You said you started with uh, Semyon and Shiraz. What's some of the other varieties that you're showcasing and how would you describe your wine? So I am also making Pinot Noir and um, this year Fiano from Langhorn Creek. That was a like a scholarship sort of thing that I won. Langhorn Creek did a put the call out for winemakers to apply for two tonne of wine so they could showcase what the region could do. Wow. And they had such a cool list of varieties, so I jumped on board and um, chose Fiano. So I'm really excited about that. I'm excited to try that. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. And we're we're also playing now a little bit with um, some different regions. So I am really Adelaide Hills-based and I always will be, but now I've got that Langhorn Creek and my partner and I secured some fruit down at um, Port Elliot on a tiny little south facing vineyard which I've never ever worked with a south facing vineyard and it's Pinot Noir so that's in the winery at the moment and it's pretty cool so um, I would describe my wines as um, moving goalposts I guess every year they're a bit different <laughs> <laughs> they've always got the common thread of the vineyards like the Shiraz I, it, it just has this common thread through it that is I just can't I, I would never want to lose it, but it just, no matter what the vintage is like, no matter if it's been wet, hot, you know, it's always there, just this sort of black jelly bean thing in there. Um, so I can always see um, the effects of the vineyard, but I can also see the effects of the year. And because I don't try and shape the wine in any sort of way, 
they just end up how they are. But to me, actually, I think they're quite pure and they are an expression of me, I hope. Now, you're saying earlier that, you know, the impact, immediate impact was to, to shut everything down in regards to your business almost overnight. And then some of the initiatives that Restaurateurs activated helped with sales of wine. But could you give us a, a picture of the current situation that you're in compared to when all of this started? Um, so the current situation, I guess I'm feeling a bit more positive now. So when it first started, just before that, things were fantastic. I think we were, Australia was just living a beautiful time. There were people were out eating and drinking and, and sales were really good and international sales were fantastic. And then it hit in that initial week. I just, I just fell into a hole of, oh my gosh, my dream's gone. I can't, how will I ever sustain this? How am I ever going to sell a bottle of wine again? Because my main chain is gone it's and and I felt awfully sad and devastated for all the people that had supported my brand through all this that they'd lost their um their you know their income and their businesses but I guess um after a few days of this um I realized that they were pulling themselves back up so I could probably pull myself back up too so now I feel positive. I feel almost a little bit excited about when things um, kick off again. Um, the, um, the, I don't know, there's just a nice feeling that people are ready to be a community and support each other. But where we are, right, where I am right now is I'm selling enough, enough wine to um, look after my family. And... Um, just sort of fumble through but it's definitely not a sustainable place that I'm in but yeah I think the future's bright. How can people help small producers like you right now until things start going again? They can order from us it really is um it is the best scenario is to see website orders coming in We, we have our cellar door open for takeaway but you know we're down on the coast People aren't down here, so it's not a huge thing really. And we're in the winery a lot because it's vintage, so the cellar door's open. But takeaway, it's not the experience. It's it's not a huge thing. So to order online is massive. And if you if anyone sees it, just on a list to to just support anyone, everyone, just support everyone. Buy a bottle. <laughs> it's just um, <laughs> it's, the, it's the way you know. But it's but then I feel you know I say that. But then I really feel for my distributors as well because I know that oh it's just it's it's just a shit sandwich really the whole um, the whole chain is just in flux at the moment and I know that everyone and all of those points is trying really hard to get sales but it is the 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 best thing for me to have it ordered through the website. What impact have you seen on local juice producers? You know, not just the wine world, but you know you'd have like a lot of local producers around you as well. Um, yeah, huge. I think, um, it's, well, I don't know. I was listening to a thing the other day about farming and I think farming, that's sort of a bit insular to it and we've all still got to eat so that hopefully, uh, they are surviving okay, but all the restaurants and cafes and, and those sort of industry around us are closed and sad about it. In terms of my, um, my peers in the industry, Um, I noticed early on that everyone was just on this crazy discounting bandwagon. And I know, being a small producer, that that is absolutely not sustainable because, um, you know, you've got got to eat. So um, I think that sort of stopped a bit and people now, uh, we're all talking to each other and that's really lovely because there's a bit of, um, there's a bit of that community feel. So you feel like you're sort of being pulled along and doing a lot of these collaborations as well with, other people and other um other um not just in the wine industry but other industries um it's 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 enormous i feel like people are on the up i hope i'm right how has wine changed your life oh it's it's everything it's before my children that was my children i love wine it's cool you can track it from um the ground right through the bottle into the market sitting at a table that's beautiful about it but um 
the thing that I've noticed this vintage is that I really love the team aspect of it. And because we have small children uh, and we lost childcare early on uh, in the COVID-19 piece, it's been a really lonely vintage because I've done my vintage stuff during the day and some nights and my partner's been in there when I haven't been in there. So it's been, it hasn't had that great sort of party feel that vintage is. Like everyone's excited you're always ripping around to other winemakers' houses and looking at what they've got going on, and it's just a really beautiful time of year. But um, this year we've all been locked down, and I feel like, I, yeah, I, I realise through this that that is a huge part of it for me. It's also changed my life because we travel. We travel so much. We travel to all these amazing places where we sell wine and to different wine regions because we're hungry to know and we're hungry to see what's out in the world. And wine regions are always in beautiful places, so we're pretty fortunate. Do you think the... Um uncertainty about travel will have an impact on winemaking? Yes, I do. I think we will, if it continues and people don't travel, I, I do wonder what it will do to um, people's inspiration because everyone gets inspiration from their overseas vintages or, or visiting overseas regions. Um, but I guess we, we all have an imagination so we can all um, make, do things with grapes. But I do wonder, I do wonder if, if there'll be, if this is long term, what what effect that'll have. In terms of the marketplace though, I know our markets are looking like they're all bouncing back overseas, but it's hard to know that your product's in a place and you can't go there and tell the story yourself. So you're really relying on people that you've sometimes never met selling your wine and that's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow. A few moments ago, you were saying how different it is making this vintage because of the circumstances. Um, do you, how do you think you'll look back on this vintage in the coming years? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. I'll be really interested to see what my wines from this vintage look like in bottle because to me you can always see the personality. You can always see the the joy of the person making the wine and the wines. But I just I, I think it's undeniable. You can, you, can, um, you can tell if the wine was manufactured in a big place and it's got – lost its soul a little bit or you know I'll, I'll be interested to see how the wines in the bottle look if they'll be bouncy or if they'll be a little bit subdued um and I think I'll just look back on the vintage as just a surreal time in in life just and and not just vintage every aspect of everything it's just been um a lonely time and in the winery in a lonely time in the world, I think, for some people. On a lighter note, how do you like to enjoy a glass of wine? Just after the kids have gone to bed. <laughs> after the kids have gone to bed, I just about break the bottle trying to get the cap off. <laughs> no, I enjoy wine. And, oh, oh, my gosh, there's room for wine in most things. You know, we've been known to have breakfast wine and people have champagne breakfast, which we used to quite enjoy quite a bit. But... Um, any occasion, I think um, with a nice meal, and undeniably that's just beautiful when a food and a wine matches beautifully. That's just such a lovely, lovely experience. And, you know, I don't think many people really get to experience that. I think um, that, and that's the beauty of Psalms, isn't it, is just going somewhere and having someone that's really thought about that and you get to experience that beautiful thing. I love that. But I also like... Um, you know, a beautiful crisp wine on a hot day on the back lawn with kids. Not that they're drinking it, but <laughs> or um, you know, you're always you always whenever you like a girlfriend comes over and you say, "Should we have a wine?" It's like a celebration when you have a wine. You always look forward to taking that top off and drinking it with someone, and either having a chat or having a heart to heart or having a laugh. Or um, it's I think it's a part of it's definitely a part of my a huge part of my life. It's a part of my emotional life and my daily life or, or most daily life I guess and um, it's also the celebration part too like we look for any excuse to go and buy a bottle of French fizz any excuse will do so it's nice to celebrate with something nice well as the father of twin toddlers I can I can agree with you on trying to rip the top of a bottle of wine open as quickly as possible in the afternoon um, it certainly tastes a lot better um, these <laughs> days. Um, Charlotte, it's been amazing to have a chat. Uh, please keep in touch and good luck with the, the what's to come and um, we'll talk again soon. Thanks for the opportunity, Huck. I really appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Stay safe, isolate and be well.